last time that I saw you. Death to the atheists was a cry that was heard during the course of the second century of the Common Era. It sometimes surprises students that <clears throat> this cry was directed towards Christians in particular. That the reason for which there were local riots against Christians in places like Rome, Alexandria, Ephesus, and Corinth was that they specifically denied the existence of the gods of Greece and Rome. And for that reason, they would not take part in civic festivals in honor of those go gods. Now, some people were in fact exempt from the requirement of a sacrifice to the gods. The most famous exemption went to the people who belonged to what the Roman law called the religion of the Jews or of the Judeans. Because Rome, during the period of the Republic, had entered into an alliance with Judea, those who practiced the religion of the Judeans were held to belong to a legal congregation. That meant they could provide for their sacrifice in Jerusalem, they could worship weekly in synagogues, and they were exempt from the requirement of sacrifice to the local gods. But you can immediately see the difficulty involved when you get non-Jews becoming followers of Jesus. They no longer have the cover of Judaism in order to be exempt from the requirement of sacrifice to the local gods. And for that reason, when Christians were persecuted and in some cases executed, it was on the charge of atheism in particular, under one guise or another. That's what brings me to the particular inquiry over the next series. I have an interest, and I think several people have an interest, in the abstract issue of Christianity and philosophy. What happens when we put a philosopher of a given period into dialogue with a theologian of that same period? We should learn something about both philosophy and theology as a result of that. But while that may appear to us to be interesting, and I think it is interesting, for Christianity of the second century, it was a matter of survival. Because it was necessary to find a way in which one could explain to the Greco-Roman world why properly understood Christianity is not atheism, although it rejects the existence of the gods of Greece and Rome. In the midst of making out that case, Christianity used the philosophical language which was ambient during its time. And today, in particular, I would like to consider two thinkers who developed that language in quite different but comparable ways. The one is a thinker who got his background in Alexandria. His name was Plotinus. You can see his dates on the first line of the handout. He was a Neoplatonist and known for that quite simply. He has no recorded opinion about Christianity for the simple reason that Christianity was beneath his radar. This, after all, was still a period of persecution. 
And alongside him, I'd also like to consider his near contemporary, the theologian Origen, who also received his education in Alexandria. In both cases, we're dealing with Neo-Platonists, that is, those who were picking up the thought of Plato and applying it to their time. In each case, we're dealing with thinkers who had belonged to a seminar run by Ammonia Saka in Alexandria. Plotinus would go on eventually and found his own seminar in Rome. Uh, Origen would travel very widely, and his seminars took place in the context of the church. He was a catechist. He was someone who prepared people for baptism. It's an interesting thought as you read Origen, who is widely reputed to be among the most accomplished of all Christian theologians, that he developed this discourse to help people to be baptized with self-awareness. Quite a different curriculum from that which is followed at the moment. But first, I'd like to address the issue of why Plotinus and Origen are comparable. As Neoplatonists, each of them has got to confront a difficulty in regard to Platonism that had clearly emerged by the third century when they wrote. As you know, Platonism at its base makes a distinction between what it considers to be the real world, and the real world is the ideal. It is not what you perceive. Whatever you perceive, you don't get in Platonism. In fact, whatever you perceive, you can't get. Because what you perceive is not real. The distinction between the ideal and the perceptible is fundamental to all forms of Platonism, including Neoplatonism. I was saying to a seminar earlier today, in this sense, the third century is the opposite of the 21st century. In the 21st century, we all deal with the settled common sense convention that perception gives us as much reality as there is. In the third century, the common convention is perception is deceptive. And you can arrive at the real only by means of philosophy. That is the function of philosophy, to deliver you an actual reality, not the illusion that is all around you. For us, this point of view might appear to be esoteric, largely because it continues to influence various schools of mystical thought. But in the third century, it was not in the least esoteric. It was common sense. In fact, the great question that Platonism had to answer and had as yet not answered was this. If the ideal is the real and the material is a deceptive copy of what is real, why should there be any relationship between the two to begin with? Why should the ideal bother with the material? Is it that instead we should consider this to be a matter of a vast rupture between those two categories, the real ideal and the material perception. It is just that question that Plotinus picked up 
in his work, which is known as the Aeneads. It was actually compiled by one of his students into groups of books with nine sections. Each section is therefore an Aeneid, and the whole volume refers to them in the plural. And Plotinus develops his position by means of his analysis of the soul and how the soul works, the way in which we can understand it, and how this finally addresses the dichotomy between the ideal and the perceptible. And I have given you a series of quotations from Plotinus, first of all, and then we'll go on to compare that to Origen's approach to this same problem. So from the point of view of Plotinus, he makes the argument that we live, we human beings, as body, but in fact our bodies are dispensable. What makes us, properly speaking, human is the possession of soul. And in his view, soul uses the body, but at the end of the day, the body has no genuine influence over the soul. And so he says, now if soul uses body as a tool, it does not have to admit the affections which come through the body. Craftsmen are not affected by the affections of their tools. It is simply an instrument. But then that raises the question, if that is the case, then why do I, as soul, become dissatisfied with my existence in body? Why do I feel sensations which are negative? Why do I desire pleasures which cause me to override what I know very well my soul wishes to do? This causes him to make a distinction between the accidental influence of what we perceive and what Plotinus considers to be genuine perception by the soul. And so he writes in the second excerpt from 117, so external sensation is the image of this perception of the soul, which is in its essence truer and is a contemplation of forms alone without being affected. That is to say, true sensation by the soul is not of anything material, but is instead a direct contemplation of another form. It is one ideal form communicating to another. And he goes on to say, from these forms, from which the soul alone receives its lordship over the living being come reasonings and opinions and acts of intelligence. And this is precisely where we are. The part which begins on the level is of thought is, I suppose, the true man. So actual humanity for Plotinus is a contemplative act. It is when immortal soul perceives other immortal forms. It should not be seen as the influence of the material on the ideal. This then causes him to pose the question to himself of how it is that this perception from soul to form relates to our perception of what he calls God and what he calls the good and what he calls the one. Those three terms all refer to the same eternal reality. 
they are not quite synonymous. Each of them is referring to a different way of referring to this primordial truth. But the conception is this is a unity, a one. There is exactly one principle, eternal, from which every other principle derives. This is intrinsically a part of Neoplatonism. Plotinus might therefore refer to it as the one. He can also refer to it as the good in the sense that it is the source from which all that is useful emerges. He can also refer to it as God in the sense that God represents the purpose, the guiding principle of all that's going on. He's not using the language of God in the same way that it's used in other systems, religious or otherwise, but he is using it seriously as referring, as Plato used it, to the entire purpose of the system as a whole. That's why he then poses the question, but how do we possess God? He rides mounted on the nature of the intellect and true being, we are there third in order, counting from God, being made, Plato says, from the undivided, that which is above, and from that which is divided in bodies. We must consider this part of soul as being divided in bodies in the sense that it gives itself to the magnitudes of bodies in proportion to the size of each living being since it gives itself to the whole universe, though the soul is one. There is one soul in Plotinus. It is not anyone's individual soul. It is literally a world soul to which human beings have access but from which they cannot be separated. This notion of a world soul is probably derived by Plotinus from the thought of Pythagoras, but in the way of Neoplatonists, he's bringing this thought in because he wants to solve a problem inside Plato. And he believes that he has accomplished just that with his argument of the world soul. Now near in time to Plotinus, also in Alexandria, is Origen, the Christian catechist. He is also fascinated by the remarkable capacity of even this perceptible world to have a certain coherence despite the fact that it's not a direct representation of the ideal. Origen, however, is going to see the coherent principle in other terms as compared to Plotinus. Origen writes, but God who by the unspeakable skill of his wisdom transforms and restores all things, whatever their condition, to some useful purpose and the common advantage of all recalls these very creatures so different from each other in mental quality to one harmony of work and endeavor. So that diverse though the motion of their souls may be, they nevertheless combine to make up the fullness and perfection of a single world. Origin is astonished that there should only be one world. Because he thinks, when you consider that the ideal and the material exist side by side, why should there only be one intersection between those two? Perhaps there is more than one universe. Origin understood the theoretical possibility of a multiverse prior to the invention of quantum physics in the 20th century. He arrived at that point 
by considering the implications of having the ideal and the material exist side by side. And out of that thought, there came his realization that the existence of a world that we can perceive at all means there's an organizing principle not only behind the world, but actually in the world, making the world a coherent mix of the ideal and the material. So, he is near to the conception that Plotinus developed of world soul. Near to it, but we're about to see he also takes it in a different direction. This is the second quotation on page two. Yet as our one body is composed of many members and is held together by one soul, so we should, I think, accept the opinion that the universe is, as it were, an immense, colossal animal, held together by the power and reason of God as by one soul. So he is well aware of the conception of a world soul. He makes the comparison. It is held together as by one soul. But for origin, this organizing principle is not a collective soul. Instead, it should be understood as being divine power and reason. He has a notion of there existing such a thing as mind, as nous in Greek, as reason, which refers to that which gives coherence and that which perceives coherence. There has to be an organizing principle that comes directly from God, he argues, and that organizes the body. It has to be of literally cosmic dimensions, and it must have existed for all time. That is Origen's conception of Christ. Origen, when he thinks of Christ, does not think as we do of Jesus. It is frequently commented that the quest for the historical Jesus, as it is called, is a modern quest. There's a reason for that. It is that the fundamental reality of Christ, as far as origin is concerned, is philosophical and has to do with the only way in his mind that the universe can be accessible to the human, and that is for the human to permeate the universe. That human permeation of the universe is for origin exactly what Christ is. It is an eternal aspect of God. It is God reasoning through the universe. It is the equivalent in origin of the world soul in Plotinus. Now the fact that Origen and Plotinus go their separate ways over the issue of soul has another and very interesting implication, and that is they also go their separate ways on the issue of body. We already saw that for Plotinus, soul and body are different. They happen at the moment to be together, but that is an accident. Whether you think it's a happy accident or an unhappy accident it will depend upon your mood at a given moment. But there is nothing necessary for Plotinus about the connection between soul and body. Origen thinks otherwise, and you can see this in the last entry on page two. He's thinking ahead now to a conception of how God, through his reasoning, reconciles everything in the world 
which is outside his reasoning over time. And so he writes, when the universe has been subject to Christ and through Christ to God, with whom it becomes one spirit, in view of the fact that rational beings are spirits, watch what he does now. Then also, the bodily substance itself, being united to the best and purest spirits, will be changed in proportion to the quality of merits of those who wear it into an ethereal condition. For origin, body, like soul, can bear eternity. And for that very reason, it is reasonable in his mind to speak of the existence of what he calls, following St. Paul, a spiritual body. He doesn't think that resurrection from the dead applies to physical body, but he does think that it applies to spiritual body on the grounds that even as we exist at the moment, we do have this noose, we do have this reason and your reason, whatever it is, your capacity to perceive what is eternal is necessarily embodied. No body, no you. And for that reason, insofar as we can participate in eternity at all, we already see that there is a principle in us which continues. So that for Plotinus, body has to be categorized entirely on the side of what is material. For origin, body already represents an eternal principle of reason which is not going to go away. So origin represents Christianity coming to grips with a view of philosophy that makes sense of God, that applies to the range of human experience and which, at the end of the day, it would be extremely difficult, even for an opponent, to dismiss as being atheism. Thanks so much. Thank you very much. Yes, I've kept an eye on my time and I've just kept myself to the half hour. So we're okay. We started a little late even without Winston Churchill, but we're okay. Um, yes, please. Okay, sure. If you look over on the uh, handout, uh, you see that Plotinus lived from 204 until 270, right? And then Origen from 184 to 253. So they're both... Uh, representative and very powerful third century uh, figures. Uh, also, all of their lives are lived prior to the decision of Constantine that he would tolerate Christianity. So Christianity remains at this time an illegal religion, what was called by Roman law a superstitio. Uh, so I was saying to some students earlier this morning, Origen of Alexandria went on lecture tour to Greece, to Asia Minor, elsewhere in North Africa, to Caesarea and Jerusalem at a time when his religion was illegal. It's really quite a remarkable accomplishment. I think I saw, yes, Tess. Excellent. This is a wonderful question that I'll repeat for Fred Cartier's tape. Uh, the question is, how then is the death of the individual conceived by these two thinkers? And in this regard, I'd like to call your attention to the quotation marks I introduced next to each of these figures 
First Plotinus, and then I'll get to origin in the moment. So on page one, Plotinus, this is a quotation attributed to Plotinus. It's just like the quotation I'm about to come to, to origin, that I can't prove he said, and that no one can prove he said, but which, which was taken up very soon after the death of each thinker to represent his point of view, and which I think does represent his point of view very well. And in their different ways, they directly relate to this issue, what becomes the death of the individual. So in the first case, Plotinus said, I think he did, try to bring back the God in you to the divine in the all. Now, this is one of those it's like a Zen koan, right? You read it and you think, what is this possibly about? And I, I remember reading these words when I was an undergraduate at Bard College and thinking, oh, isn't that wonderful? I wonder what it means. But once you grasp his conception of the world soul, then you see how this works. Because in Plotinus, your understanding of yourself as an individual only comes to you with the freight of this world. It is a mistake to believe that you are an individual because the soul that is in you is indistinguishable from the world soul. So at the moment of your death, you are giving that God, that divine principle, back to that divine principle which is already present in the all. Uh, it, in its expectation, is very much like certain forms of pantheism, where you have the idea that essentially everything is divine, so all that occurs represents a return to the divine, of the divine, including the individual. So the individual's death is the individual passing from a illusory individual to the collective of the world soul as a whole. Exactly, exactly. And that soul that you throw back in the pot, in the world soul, has always been in the world soul anyway. You only thought of it as being separate. Exactly. In this regard, I'd point out that uh, Plotinus is much more collective in his view of the soul than is Socrates uh, at the very end of the Republic. At the end of the Republic, uh, Plato has Socrates uh, give a account of a vision which he said that a soldier had who had died apparently but who hadn't died was revived and when he was revived after many days on the battlefield he recounted what he perceived as we would say on the other side and there, in what's called the myth of Ur, uh, Socrates represents a view of the soul which is cyclical, not collective. The idea is that soul after death goes to a place where it is dealt with according to its behavior. There is a good place and there is a bad place. And then after that, the souls are collected again and they themselves decide how they're going to return. And after they have decided how they're going to return, they pass through the plane of forgetfulness and they completely forgot what they decided so that then they return and they have to pick up. Now, the entire myth, obviously, is a mix of metaphor and analysis but Socrates' understanding there is clearly more individualistic than what you have in Plotinus. This is one of the many ways in which Neoplatonists, in their own understanding, while repairing Plato, making it better, 
clearly made it different and developed new and really very interesting uh, analyses that wouldn't have been possible beforehand. Now, if we turn over on the next page to the quotation I've associated with origin, this one begins with a definition of God. God is a sphere whose circumference is nowhere and whose center is everywhere. So that once you begin with the geometrical pattern, you then explode it by your play with the dimensions. And Origen's reason for doing this is he wants to, the emphasis to be on the center being everywhere. The center being everywhere is that reasoning by which the world is put together. Now, Origen, unlike Plotinus, thinks that human beings, by their very capacity to perceive what is immortal, are immortal. That is, if there's an element about you which is not perishable in the same way as your material existence. Now, in asserting this, Origen is not in any sense himself a materialist. He does not believe, and this is the part of Origen which can be difficult to grasp, but he does not believe what is commonly thought today and he doesn't believe what Plotinus thought. That is, he doesn't think that the body equals physical existence. He considers that the body is not only physical, that it's perfectly reasonable also to understand that the body is spiritual. And that's why at the very last line of the final entry on page two, he refers to it, the bodily substance being changed into an ethereal condition. That is, the body is the body. You, whatever you is, and that will be somewhat mysterious, but whatever you is, is a body. If you say, as Plotinus does say, whatever you is, is a soul, Origen replies, no, that can't possibly be right. Because the you-ness of you does not exist in its collectivity. It can only exist in its specificity. And it exists in that which is able to perceive what is not finite. Your ability to perceive the spiritual means you're spiritual. But that perception, perception only happens with a body. Perception doesn't happen with a soul. The soul is too rootless to be able to perceive. We can speak meaningfully of body being animated by soul in the sense that while we are alive as we are right now, our bodies breathe. And the term soul in essence means breath. But breath is not me, right? It goes in and out and whatever. It possesses no intrinsically human or specific attribute. But perception doesn't happen without specificity and humanity. Origen argues that is a bodily function. Bodily function can exist physically, we all know what that is, but there's such a thing as a bodily function spiritually, and that's perception. So his, Origen's argument is, Plato has this wrong. Just as Plotinus says, Plato is wrong about the soul, Origen says, Plato is wrong about the body. That we all also understand, ought to understand it as being fully specific and individual, 
and therefore we can reasonably speak, and he would say reasonably and rationally speak, of people already participating in a form of eternity as they live. So that on that understanding, death is a transition into what is spiritual. And you've already started to make that transition. So they could have had a very good argument. I mean, we, you easily could have provided a, a, a third volume just putting the two of them in a room and seeing how they would defend their respective views of soul and body because they are directly contradictory. But they are directly contradictory because they're both Neoplatonists and both proud of it and like good philosophers, not willing to give ground. Yes, please, Melissa. Excellent. No, it's a good question. The question relates to the way in which Plotinus conceives of soul as being universal. And that's because, unlike Origen, uh, Plotinus does not feel any investment at all in holding up the possible eternity of the individual. All that has to exist for Plotinus is the fact of eternity and his confidence that eternity is one, is single. In fact, from that point of view, as Plotinus sees the matter, it's better not to think of individual souls being eternal. Because if you did, that would only compete with God's eternity. If the only eternity is the one eternity, then we should rather think, as in the quotation, of everything returning to that one, rather than of individuals who continue to exist alongside the one. Plotinus is also not big on what you refer to. He's not big on sin. You know, he basically thinks sin is a bad idea. Literally, that is, he thinks that people behave badly. I mean, no, I mean he lived in the third century. He knows people behave badly. You can see it around him. He's in Alexandria. There are pogroms. There are wars. There are plagues. The Roman Empire is an enormously brutal institution. So he knows that there's such a thing as sin, but he literally thinks that is a result of wrong thinking and ultimately is always correctable. And for that reason, he doesn't think like Socrates did, that there's a place for good souls and a place for bad souls. No, they simply dissolve and whatever was truly of world soul in a specific human being would just flow back into this divine animation of the universe. Well, then why should you be good? I mean, I would put it this way. First of all, if you need an incentive to be good, you're probably not much good anyhow. And if it were necessary uh, to punish people for doing bad, this would just be an endless process. It would not have any termination. So better to cut to the chase, and this would be the Plotinian argument, better to cut to the chase and abstract morality from this question. Again, this is not origin. I mean, origin does, as you can see, the last, 
this is one of the ways he differs. He says, no, no, I, as a good Neoplatonist, Origen responds, you can't abstract morality from ontology. Being and value always belong together. That is one of the few things that's good about this life, that being and value belong together. You're going to dispense with that? And do you call that an advance on Platonic thinking? So yeah, there's an answer to this, all right. Uh, and Origen gives it uh, very forcefully. But I would say there's also a counter-argument. Uh, there is the counter-argument that says we should not, and you hear this very frequently in philosophical discussion of religion, very frequently the argument comes, well, why should you be worried about you? You know, why should the individual be of such importance? Shouldn't we start from, rather, from the collective principle? That's what Plotinus is doing. And Origen's response is to say, we think about the individual because he or she is eternal, so we should think about them. So th it's a serious contention, I think, which is going on. But Melissa, you had a follow-up. Right. Melissa is very wisely, because she's been reading some Plotinus, is very wisely picking up a wrinkle in Plotinus thought. Uh, and it ha doesn't have to do with the death of the individual. It has to do with this issue of perception that I refer to in the uh, handout. The soul being the soul is in a body right now. It has really two forms of perception open to it. The one form of perception is the one I refer to because it is the true perception. That's the capacity of the soul to reflect other forms, other ideal forms. That, in Plotinus' understanding, is true perception. But understand, when that's happening, it is not I who's perceiving, right? It is my soul that is perceiving. I, on the other hand, because I'm in a body, also pick up messages that don't come from the ideal forms. I pick up messages that tell me it's lunchtime. I'm cold. I desire that. These are not perceptions of the eternal forms, obviously. And in fact, if there is a version of sin in Plotinus, it's the mistake of confusing one kind of perception, the perception of senses, with another kind of perception, the perception of the eternal forms. That's why Plotinus finds himself saying, and Origen would have really wiped the floor with him over this, this is why Plotinus finds himself saying there's such a thing as a higher soul and a lower soul. Your lower soul is your perception of, you know, water, that kind of thing. Your higher soul is your perception of the unity of all existence. But you see the problem, he's just, what was supposed to solve the issue was soul, and it was there to solve the issue of the bifurcation of ideal and material, and here you're bifurcating the soul itself. So yeah, there, there's a logical problem inside Plotinus. I, I think, personally, that's quite clear. Yes, please. Excellent question. And to some extent, 
philosophy during this period is like philosophy during our period. Uh, that is, it is a contact sport, uh, but it's not a sport that many people can play. So Plotinus is very much on his own in a class of neo uh, Platonist philosophers who run an academy in Rome, who enjoy some imperial privilege, and uh, who is so highly regarded that he's able to throw people out of his classroom. That is, if you joined Plotinus' seminar and he found out that you were a Gnostic, he'd just throw you out. He, he just didn't want to hear about it. He treated Gnostics as the fundamentalists of their time and just didn't want them in. Thought that you couldn't have any reasonable discussion. So for that reason, I don't imagine that there was widespread popular discussion of all of Plotinus. On the other hand, the other hand, there was widespread discussion of soul and of world soul. And people seriously asked, well, what does it mean to have a world soul and then to have an individual So Are they the same thing? Are they different things? So although philosophers were elite, they're elite in the sense, nonetheless, that people are imitating them. They're, they're more like the NFL than anything going on right now. I mean, you know, you and I, we're not going to do this, right? But we can watch it on TV and we can enjoy it. We can see how it's done. And we might even try it some Thanksgiving day, though it probably wouldn't be a very good idea. Philosophy worked that way in antiquity. Now, to look at the origin side of this, he's actually preparing people for baptism. You know, this is not for a PhD. It's not for any kind of qualification. He thinks that if you're about to be baptized, you should understand how it is that your eternity and Christ's eternity are linked to one another. And if you don't, I'm not going to have you baptized. So the level of popular discussion is really quite high. Another, just to give one more example of this, and then I see the Cardinal of Red Hook is about to give me a signal. I just feel it coming on. Uh, another final example of this is as a result of Origen's thought, more than anyone else's thought, the idea developed during the third century and then blossomed in the fourth century that for us to understand how Christ understood now as a principle of the universe, right? Not a person, but a principle of the universe. How Christ is related to God as creator, we really have to say that they are of the same essence. And the term for this in Greek is homo usios. And that ultimately got incorporated into one of the major creeds of Christianity, the Nicene Creed. When, when we say being of one substance, that's homo, homo usios. Well, during the time the creeds were being debated, there was a huge controversy over whether you should say that Christ is homo usios, of the same being as the Father, or should you say that Christ is homo usios, of similar being with the Father? There are riots in the streets breaking out. Over, so yeah, it's a contact sport. And one of the bishops at the council uh, records sitting down to have himself shaved and the barber has a straight razor to his throat and says, which do you think it is, homo usios or homo usios? I guess he gave the right answer because then he could tell the story. So, yeah, there's an element of elitism here, but it's, it's more the elitism of the NFL than a seminar at Princeton, you know? It's, it's something that people see going on around them. So now the Cardinal of Red Hook is give me, giving me his signal, so I have to thank you for coming. And I look for next week, having done Neoplatonism, next week we get to some Stoicism.
see what that does. Thank you.